I believe the United States of America is the greatest nation on earth. I think we should all feel that way, and I know in this room we do. I believe God has indeed shed his grace on us. We're a blessed nation, do we agree? Memorial Day is a day of remembrance, and I struggled some this week with this sermon because I, want, I wanted it to be right. Today's the day when we are to remember those who paid the ultimate price for freedom, and we also remember our loved ones who passed. But for most people in America today, I must tell you, it's nothing more than the start of the summer season and picnics and all that, and they really give no, not much thought at all unless they happen to see something on TV. But for others, it has a deeper meaning. Remembering someone close to them who's lost their life about our freedom. It's about our freedom. We take it for granted so much. And our young people, Carol and I are amazed that when we see some of the shows on TV, how little the young people today know about our history and about the things of America and about why we are who we are. And we've just taken it for granted to the degree that it's not important anymore, but it is. Those left behind, loved ones who've gone, have, they carry a sense of grief and loss, but also pride and courage and faithfulness for the loved ones that gave their lives for our country. I'm of the opinion, and you veterans will agree with me, that those who've actually been there those who served in the armed forces, put them, especially those who put themselves in harm's way, where their life could have been lost in, in any moment, have a deeper sense of appreciation, a greater sense of understanding of what this day and days like this really mean. So we honor men and women who fought for this great nation and paid the ultimate price. Uh, it's been said the best way to avoid conflict in, in, in any relationship, especially a church, is to avoid talking about mixing politics and religion. And if that's true, then I'm in trouble today because we're going to deal with both a little bit. All right. And, um, so remembering those who died goes both ways. Um, why did they die? Today, we celebrate the firm foundation upon which this, which this nation has been built. This nation was built not as some would have you believe, on secularism and diversity. This nation was built on honoring Jesus Christ. Amen. And I can prove it to you over and over again. So what does it mean to be a Christian patriot? What, are, what is that? How do we put our faith and our politics together and, and not become confused? Matthew 22, there's some guidance here. and kind of tells us what Jesus said about mixing religion and politics and where they should be divided. Matthew 22, 15. Here's what it says. If you want to turn there, you can. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent him uh, to him, their disciples, with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, being able to discern as he could, perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought to him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. And he said, render therefore the things that are Caesar's unto Caesar and to God, the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and they left him. See, this whole scene was nothing but some kind of a trick com confrontation. They're trying to trap Jesus. And we need to understand the, the setting of this. It was Holy Week. Jesus was going to be crucified very soon. And the opposition was reaching new heights. How many have watched A.D. or uh, The Passion of the Christ or uh, Killing Jesus that was on? So you know kind of the story, the situation, the setting. And even the Jews, religious Jews, religion is not the same as Christianity. Can I tell you that? Religion can have, have all kinds of parameters. 
Christianity is about the cross of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So they wanted to do away with him. And verse 15 says the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap Jesus in his words. They said, we know you're a man of integrity is what they said. They said, we know you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So they're setting him up. You know, when somebody flatters you too much, somebody says, oh, you, you're really wonderful. Oh, you just, everything you do is great. There's something behind that usually. You know, we're, too many words of flattery uh, are readying you for some kind of, but <laughs> you know how that works. They said, we know you're not swayed by men. You don't pay attention to who they are, how big they get, how much they have. They just want, we just want your opinion. Is it right to, to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So what they were doing, didn't, they didn't know it would be their undoing. By their own admission, they, they raised the issue to trap Jesus. So this issue was something that divided even the Jews in the religious community. And uh, they wanted to trap Jesus so if they could get him to answer one way or the other, like they did many other times, uh, they, they, could, they could have him uh, crucified. They did anyway. So when they brought him this Daenerys and he asked whose inscription is on it, he raised the issue to twist it on them and to flip it. He flipped the scripts what he did. He confronted them. And he asked how a devout worshiper of God is supposed to relate to governing authorities. So that's the setup for what I want to talk to you about today. How can one be a patriot and a Christian? Jesus was giving them a warning. We need to heed the warning. Do not fail to pay your taxes. We said that earlier. Caesar's name was on the money. I haven't seen Mr. Obama's face on the money yet. Could happen. But do not give to Caesar what belongs to God. There needs to be a division in our minds about what we're doing. Matthew continued. They were amazed, he said. So they left and went away. Why were they amazed? Because Jesus didn't completely answer the question or settle the issue. They were insincere, simply trying to trap him. So he put the ball back in their court. He wanted them to wrestle with greater issues. And he wants us to wrestle with those same issues today. What is right? and What is not right? How can we be a Christian and a true patriot? He wants us to wrestle with this. How do we know what's what and what belongs to whom? The church has always struggled with that question. Some churches never touch um, politics, won't say a word about it. And that's okay, not a problem. And we don't talk a lot about it here, but sometimes we do, and I think that's okay. My friend Jerry Falwell, who's a good friend of ours, talked about it a lot, as you remember. So what is the relationship? How do we give to Caesar that which is Caesar's and God that which is God? Here's a principle in Philippians 3.20 and in verse, uh, chapter 4 and verse 1 that I think will help clear up some things. This is the application of Jesus' principle that Paul was writing to the church at Philippi. Here's what it says. But our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by, that pow by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Chapter four, verse one. Therefore, my brothers, you whom love and long for my joy and my and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord. The premise of this scripture is that we have dual citizenship. We are a part of the United States of America, but our home is in heaven. This is how we deal with it. Our true citizenship. Actually, when I pull my passport out when I'm going to some other country, I ought to pull out the one that says heaven. I don't know what the customs and the, uh, those guys would do with that. Now, I can think of no greater earthly privilege than being a citizen of the United States of America. There are people who are dying to get here where we are with the things that we take for granted. But I value even more highly my citizenship in heaven. My heavenly citizenship is where I'm headed. It's my home. It's where I'm going. And you know what? While we are citizens of the United States, ultimately we live under a higher law. That's where the confusion comes in sometimes. Let me give you an illustration. A Lexington, Kentucky lady received a traffic ticket when running a stop sign 
on her way to court. Um, section 149, she went to her lawyer and she said, is there some way I can get out of this citation? He said, I think so. She was headed uh, to court uh, and uh, section 149 of the Kentucky Constitution says, oh, oh, she was headed to vote, that's where she was going. It says, voters in all cases except treason, felony, breach, or surety of the peace, or violation of election laws shall be privileged from arrest during their attendance at elections and while they're going to and returning therefrom. <laughs> now you better check Missouri and see if he's got one before you go 100 miles an hour to go vote. <laughs> but if it's on there, I guess you could. Anyway, when she did go to court, case was dismissed. They cited the law. She was, see, here's the deal. She's living in the United States and she's going by the regular rules, but she's living under another set of laws protection. Now, we live under a higher law as Christians. That doesn't mean we can ignore all the laws of this land. <clears throat> Even the disciples wrestle with that. Even Jesus, in a way, wrestled with that. Pontius Pilate wrestled with that. Herod, uh, at, uh, at the uh, crucifixion time, wrestled with all this. The Jews, those in the, uh, the, the hierarchy of the Jewish leadership wrestle with this. United States, not, not actually the chosen nation of God like Israel is, has been richly blessed because our founding fathers and our citizens have understood there's a higher law that we need to abide by and that all our other laws need to come in under that. Thomas Jefferson wrote this. It's not something that O'Reilly or Sean Hannity or, or even Ronald Reagan wrote. Thomas Jefferson can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that their liberties are the gift of God? Now, liberal people would argue our gifts, our freedom is not from God. Paul wrote in Romans 13, verse 1, everyone must submit to governing authorities for all authority comes from God. Thomas Jefferson believed that. And those in positions of authority have been placed there by God. Some of us have trouble believing that today. That's what it says here. So anyone who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted and they will be punished. For the authorities do not strike fear in people who are doing right and in those who are doing wrong. Seems like in our world, right is wrong and wrong is right these days. Would you like to live without fear of the authorities? Do what is right. They will honor you. The authorities are God's servants sent for your good. But if you're doing wrong, of course, you should be afraid for they have the power to punish you. They are God's servants <clears throat> sent for the very purpose of punishing those who do what is wrong. So you must submit to them, not only to avoid punishment, but also to keep a clear conscience. And he goes on to say, pay your taxes too. These same reasons for government workers need to be paid. They're serving God in what they do. Give to everyone what you owe them. Pay your taxes and government fees to those who collect them and give respect and honor to those who are in authority. That's straight out of the word of God. And this is not a smorgasbord where we can take and leave what we want. Leave the part we don't like, take the part we do like. That's pretty strong. Every one of the 13 colonies had a biblical foundation at its founding. Did you know that? Each one of them revered the scriptures as ultimate authority. We've come a long way from that. One supreme loyalty is God himself. And with that as our understanding, we can consider how to give back our allegiance. Look at what God said that makes a great nation. Deuteronomy 4 or 5. I'm going to read it from the message. Uh, I guess uh, the message. Well, Adrian, you can follow along in your new Bible. It says, pay attention. I'm teaching you the rules and regulations that God commanded me. It's Moses talking. So that you may live by them in the land you're entering to take up ownership. Keep them. Practice them. You'll become wise and understanding. When people hear and see what's going on, they'll say, what a great nation. So wise, so understanding. We've never seen anything like it. Yes, what other great nation has gods that are intimate with them the way God, our God, is with us, always ready to listen to us? And what other great nation has rules and regulations as good and fair as this revelation that I'm setting before you today? Just make sure you stay alert. Keep close watch over yourselves. 
Don't forget anything of what you've seen. Don't let your heart wander off. Stay vigilant as long as you live. Teach what you've seen and heard to your children and grandchildren. Hmm. Watching a program the other day, and it's amazing to me what our children don't know. So do we blame the schools or do we step up? I think even if your children are in public schools today and they're not getting what you think they should get, I think it's time for parents to step up, not just look the other way or roll over and play dead, not just go to the television, take the children under your wing, get the history books out that they're not learning, get out some materials that they're not being taught and teach them. That's what he's saying here. You have responsibility as parents and grandparents. And if we're going to see this world, especially this nation, be what it ought to be, what God intended it to be, we're going to have to step up. There's some important points here. In, in verse 7, I'll read this from the New King James. We just, we just read over this in the message. It says, For what great nation is there that God that has got so near to it as the Lord God is to us? Moses reminds the people of Israel that they are great because God was close to them. God stayed with them. They revered God. They honored God. He discerned and acknowledged the presence of God in their greatness as a nation. I believe one of the reasons for the blessings of God in America is that we have revered God but we're slipping far away from it. And if we are to be, continue to be a great people, we must acknowledge God. A great nation acknowledges God. Those who first settled uh, this country at Plymouth Rock in 1620 were people who acknowledged God. They came here so they might be able to worship God freely because they've been bound. Here's what Patrick Henry said. He was a Christian patriot. We know this one, but I'm going to read another one. Is life so dear, peace so sweet? as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. We know that one. But he also said, it cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. He knew the difference, not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. This country was fought for. Lives were lost all through our history to protect the foundations that were based in the very gospel of Jesus Christ. We acknowledged God, we discerned God, we sought God, and we were blessed by God. One of the great slogans of the American Revolution was, no king but King Jesus. In the army, now they won't even let you say the name Jesus in the military. In the chaplains are being bound to not say the name Jesus because it might offend someone. Something's gone wrong. And as we stand and fight against the satanic forces of this age, we must see that God's presence comes into our lives in a way knowing that Jesus with us is the only thing that will help us to stand as we fight the battles that are ahead of us. Those times in our lives when tragedy strikes and trouble comes, just knowing Jesus, you knowing we, we did it, call upon the name of the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. The great nation, secondly, discerns God's presence and depends on prayer. We were a nation of prayer. Mama prayed, grandma prayed, great grandma prayed. How about you? How about me? Whatever reason, let's read all that verse 7. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? And it says, for whatever reason, that means whatever reason we, we see, we may call upon him. If whatever is happening in my life, I can call upon him. Call upon the name of the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Isn't it great to know when God's people pray, God shows up? Amen. I'm telling you, when God's people pray, God enters. Praise and prayer. What, what weapons we have. Amen. Psalm 145, 18 says, The Lord's near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. So a great nation discerns God's presence and praise and is dedicated to the principles of God. Now what makes a great nation? Is it the politician? No, it's us. And the more that we as people of America who understands this dedication to the principles of God stand up, 
the stronger this nation will become. Deuteronomy 4, 8. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law, which I set before you this day. Principles of the word of God are truth. They're the moral compass. The Ten Commandments weren't called the Ten Suggestions. They weren't something we can just take and leave. Something we can do or not do as we choose. Like I said, it's not a smorgasbord. And yet uh, our, our people today, outside the church particularly, want to just take part of it and leave part of it and do whatever they want to do. In the early 1830s, a Frenchman named Alexis de, de uh, I can't pronounce the name, de Tocqueville, I was trying to pronounce it, de Tocqueville. Alexis de Tocqueville came, he wrote, he came and he was a Frenchman, he came across uh, America and he studied America. He went to churches, he went to universities, he went all across America. He talked to the people of America and he wrote uh, his studies in a work called Democracy in America. And here's what he said. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there. I sought in her fertile fields and boundless prairies, and it was not there. I sought in her rich mines and her vast world commerce. It was not there. It was not until I went to the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her gen genius and power. America is great because America is good. If America ever ceases to be good, it will also cease to be great. Amen. Amen. God isn't blessing America because of Hollywood, or Washington, D.C. God is blessing America today because people are meeting in places like this all across this nation praying and asking God to bless this country, asking God to bless our leaders. A great nation discerns God's presence and a great nation is dedicated to the principles of God and prays and is determined to pass it on to the generations. That's why I said what I said a moment ago about you, maybe your grandparents now. We speak to our grandparent, uh, grandchildren fairly often. And we're always talking to them about how we're praying for them and how they need to follow God. And, and our, our oldest grandson, our oldest grandchild, our grandson, who's uh, uh, 20 years old, said to us the other day, we asked him, are you in church? Because he's in college. He's taking summer classes to get ahead. And we said, are you in church? He said, I am some. He said, I need to get into the word more. And I said, I know you do. We didn't hound on him. We didn't, didn't blast him. We just asked him. And we loved him. And he knows he's loved. Here's what Deuteronomy 4, 9 says. Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children <clears throat> and to your grandchildren. You know, I believe whether or not our children and our great-grandchildren will enjoy the freedoms that we have enjoyed very well depends upon what we do now. Right now. God has a high calling for this nation. And if Christians don't do what Second Chronicles 7.14 says, we don't humble ourselves before God and pray. We don't ask God to forgive our sins and heal our land. God won't step in. But when we do, the higher call, the call of his own people, you know, the call of Christianity to a lot of people means no more than a call to organize religious activity. Just get together and meet and pray a little bit or, or meet and read a scripture and talk about it. But Jesus never issued that kind of call. His call was clearly a call from a cross at Calvary. We can talk about America. We can talk about how bad it is. We can talk about what the government doesn't do. <clears throat> we can talk about we don't like the president, we don't like the Senate, we don't like our state house government, we don't like our mayors, we, we can talk about all that. But it's up to us to stand strong. Matthew 16, 24 says, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself. You know what that is? That's commitment. Hardly anyone will ever commit if it's all about themselves. I even think about commitment in this church. Some of you have never committed to do anything that puts you out of your way. Some of you would 
not commit because you think, well, I don't want to do that because I might want to go on a trip or I might want to have somebody over and I might not come to church. And if I don't, if I, if I don't get all my 12 hours of sleep the night before, I can't make it. And commitment is to deny myself to get up with bleary eyes and a snotty nose and, and hurting ankles and, and feet and hips that don't work right and say, I will be in the house of God and I will serve in my place. I will deny myself. I will take up his cross and I will follow my assignment until I die. But if I will do what God says do, that's what I'm going to do. Amen. Now, when a man decided to take up his cross, Disciples knew when Jesus said that. They knew what it meant. I don't think we do. He was not simply bearing a burden. He, he was dying for a cause. They knew that this was going to cost them their lives. These men stood strong in their faith. They would not bend. Matthew was slain with a sword at a distant city of Ethiopia. Luke was hanged upon an olive tree in the land of Greece. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil, but escaped death in a miraculous manner. He was afterwards branded at Patmos. You know, when we think about it, Peter was crucified at Rome with his head down. James the Greater was beheaded at Jerusalem. This is not the first time beheadings have happened. It happened to the followers of Christ, the closest followers of Christ, folks. James the Less was thrown from a lofty pinnacle of the temple, beaten to death with a fuller's club. Nathaniel was flayed alive, cut open while he was living. Andrew bound to a cross while he hung on the cross. He kept preaching until the persecutors killed him. Thomas was run through the body with a lance at Coromandel in the East Indies. Jude was shot to death with arrows. Matthias was first stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas was stoned to death at Salonica. Paul, after various tortures and persecution, was beheaded at Rome by the Emperor Nero. And for almost 300 years, Christianity was forbidden across the world. We think we got it tough because my knee hurts. Got it tough because I got a headache. Got it tough because the ball game is on today. Christians were publicly whipped, dragged by their, by their heels through the streets until their brains were actually scattered along the route. I'm telling you, we don't know what it is to live for Christ and to take up the cross. We have it so easy. I pledge my allegiance. These people's limbs were torn off, their ears and noses cut off, their eyes were, were, were dug out with sharp sticks or burned out with hot irons. Sharp knives run under their fingernails. Melted lead poured over their, their bodies while they lived. Drowned, beheaded, crucified, ground between stones, torn by wild beasts. Let me tell you, read Hebrews 11. Read that great list and then down at the bottom where, bottom where it says, but they all received their reward. Not here, but they were receivers of their reward. Let me ask you, what would it take for you to deny Christ? Or have you already done it? What about your allegiance? How long would you be able to take the pressure and the persecution and the torture before you recanted and said, oh, no, no, let me live, let me live, let me live. Could you bear up the pressure? Could you stand the real persecution? It may come right here in Branson, Missouri, and across this nation. I'm telling you, don't hide your head in the sand and pretend it can't happen. Those early Christians died for what they believed. After torture and persecution, could we do the same? Would we do the same? Are you willing to stand that strong and tall for Christ? Puts a different light on it, doesn't it? When, I, when, I, when I'm saying, well, you know, I, uh, I, I think... I think maybe I will go to church today because I don't have anything else to do. To confess to be a Christian is to be like Christ. Be willing to endure the things that he endured. Jesus shed his precious blood not to make us comfortable. To give us eternal life so that we could be uncomfortable in his service. Put ourselves to the test. And not all of us are called to die heroically or sacrificially. I know that. But we're called to live our lives every day for him. Amen. We're called to step up and be counted and, and to stand up and stand strong and have courage. We're called to give our lives away while we're living so that it's not about me. 
had a conversation with a man this week talking about success. We talked about it for a little bit and then I asked him, I said, you know, real success is if you have caused someone who comes after you to be successful. That's what success is. Success is not about what I do while I'm here, about me, it's about others. If I can win a soul to Christ, am I a success? Absolutely. If somebody comes into the kingdom of God because of my witness, am I successful? Absolutely. Somebody said this morning, they said, uh, you know, you can be a millionaire. And Craig said, yeah, the way to be a billionaire in the music business here in Branson is to start with two million. You end up with one. So money's not success. Fame is not success. Having everybody know your name is not success. Success is what you've done to create and multiply your spiritual life in others. Becoming a mentor as Jesus was to 12 so that those 12 multiplied into hundreds and those hundreds into thousands and those thousands into millions. That's success. What are you willing to do? What would it take for you to say, no, I'm not going to follow him anymore. For Peter, it only took a little girl making a couple of statements and he denied Christ, but then he repented. If you've denied Christ, I ask you to repent this morning. If the pressure and the persecution or if your comfortableness, if, if life, your lifestyle has demanded that you not be successful in God's eyes, I, I call you now to honor him with your life. What are we trying to remember on Memorial Day? The sacrifice of those who went before us, who gave us life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and eternal life. We remember our fallen heroes, and we remember our fallen heroes from the Word of God. Maybe you had a mother that was like that, who would have stood and been beheaded or stoned or killed. Maybe you had a grandmother who was like that. What about you? Are you like that? Maybe your dad was like that. Mine was. I know that. He would have stood for Christ no matter what happened to him. Throw him out in front of a 80 mile an hour truck. Wouldn't matter to him. I am not giving up. I am not backing down. I will call the name of Jesus and I'll call upon the name of the Lord. I know where I'm going. So what about you? What's your commitment like? What's the level of your commitment? It's one thing to say, I'll die for Christ. It's another thing to say, I'll teach the children on Sunday morning. You say, well, it's not the same. Yes, it is. You're denying yourself. You're standing up. You're Im implanting the heart of God into the lives of children and young people and, and Bible study or teaching or whatever it is you're doing, witnessing, driving the vans for those children to bring them to church to say, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to deny myself and I'm going to step up and I'm going to honor God and I'm going to honor others. And I'm going to say, I, I, I have the love of Jesus in my heart for people. What do you remember? Who do you remember that was that example for you? Who was that example in your life that you know, if you think back, you know, they would have stood the torture, the persecution, the test, and even death, and never have varied one iota. You know somebody like that? You think of somebody like that? And then the question is, am I like that? Father, I pray for this group today, for each one of us individually, Lord, that you would challenge us, challenge us to realize that you're not calling us to die right now. You're calling us to live. Lord, if we die at the hands of a torturer, at the hands of a murderer, who's asking us to give up this Jesus that we say we serve. Lord, I pray that if we would die for you, that we will now live for you. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us. Thank you for this great nation. Thank you for this great church. Thank you for its great people. Lord, we will step up. We will commit. We will honor you.